With no further ado, I'd like to welcome Deb Paul, our first speaker. She has a talk, Human and Infrastructure Info Evolution for 21st Century Collections. And Deb, we see your shared screen. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Good evening from wherever you are joining us. I see the, the world is in the room. Thank you very much, Erica, for that lovely introduction. This symposium has been uh, quite a while in the planning, and certainly we started be before the recent events uh, on the planet that we are all experiencing. So, but Deb, do you want to turn yeah. your video on? Sure. Hi, everybody. There I am. And uh, I'm we started the recording. Yes. All right. Hello again. And I would like to say that the, the talk has then be reframed a little bit uh, in the sense that in the middle of all the changes that we are having to adapt to and all the uncertainty we are facing, there are opportunities involved. Uh, but the topics here were relevant before. They're just, in a sense, sometimes even more relevant now or even more of an opportunity. So our symposium uh, now as it stands, after spinach being re-envisioned, these speakers uh, give us a picture from the vision of the collection managers of the future and how uh, our participants, when you contribute in the uh, Google Doc, and how our presenters see these roles changing, uh, how our leadership sees um, what's happening and what their needs are, along with some opportunities we have to engage with uh, tools that can help us with some of our data challenges like Wikidata. And then we'll get some overviews from uh, Ellie and Teresa on sort of the, the bigger picture of what might be coming next with what we need to do with the data and what skills and, and opportunities are, are there. So I wanted to start just briefly with saying the, the project that Erica and I and others here in the audience uh, work on is a National Science Foundation funded project called Advancing the Digitization of Biological Collections. And in that program, IDIG Bio is funded to help museums that also get funded to digitize specific parts of their collections, focusing on specific research questions. And so in the nine years that we've been doing this, uh, we have learned a lot. The community has gathered together and we've been able to uh, help the community help each other. And we've done that in a variety of ways. So some of you may be aware of our, our workshops that we've done and putting out workflows and protocols. Others of you may be more aware of the research use of the data strategies uh, where Pam Soltis, who I think is with us in the audience today, um, helping us with making sure that researchers have their needs met when it comes to collections. And we have education, outreach, diversity and inclusion efforts, as well as citizen science efforts. Along with that comes the training component for all of the people who are doing this work. So whether it's gathering the data, gathering the specimens, getting that data standardized, we are helping to facilitate that work so we can build the resource that is IDIG Bio and our IT staff gives us uh, so that we can search that data and, and use that data in many different ways. So what are some of the things we've learned along the way and sharing some insights from our, our larger group planning this symposium. Um, these are just some of the topics I'll touch on briefly. So here's where I'd ask you if one of these topics is interesting to you and you have a question already or an insight, um, please make a note so we don't miss it in the discussion. So I'd like to give a, a brief framework uh, about thinking about the future. If we're envisioning the future, what are the ways in which we do that or tools which we might be able to use to help us do that? So on the right-hand side, you see this sort of digitization workflow of all the things that might be happening uh, when you digitize collections. And at the bottom, you see we're generating data in the hopes of getting knowledge from it and new applications. So we have knowns. We know about things like we've how long it takes to uh, do a specific geo-reference or um, what kind of analogy we can make to, if we can do A, then we can do B. So we can make some statements about what we know. But there are other things where we realize we, we don't know the answer 
like maybe we know how long it takes to georeference speed, but we have a hypothesis that if we change something, we might be able to make it faster. So we can test that and iterate through it. But as we move down here, we have to engage with others. So brainstorming is a way in which we can discover what's in somebody else's head that we might not know. And uh, in the last one, this is one where recently at, the sympo at another symposium at Spinach, somebody said, how can I ask a question if I don't even know what to ask? And those are the tricky ones where we, we have to reach outside our own collections, outside our own expertise, outside our own leadership knowledge to figure out um, how to get at those. So this is just a vision for the entire symposium when we're talking about dreaming big and thinking about what we can do uh, going forward. So we need a skilled, inclusive, and diverse workforce. And this quote comes from uh, Australia, from the National Research Infrastructure Roadmap. The italics were added by me. And I wanted to point out here that this is really stressing that it's not about an individual workshop, it's about an ongoing commitment. And thinking about you in the audience, ask yourself what your professional development experience is when it comes to collections. At the level of collections management, at the level of leadership for managing the collections that we're creating um, in the digital space. So think about how you got those, think about how you know what they are, what the skills are that you need. Are you tracking, are you getting them? Are your, is your staff getting them? So these are some of the questions that um, people need answers to. So what about skills needs? What might they look like? And this is just an example to give you an idea of not only what the skills look like, but what the gaps are in understanding between different communities about skills needs. So these inputs come from a workshop, the very first data carpentry workshop where we asked researchers and undergraduates and graduate students to describe their skills needs. What are their challenges around data? And so some of you may see yourself in some of these. And it'd be interesting if you notice, uh, if you want to maybe put a comment in the, in the Google Doc, or any of these that resonate with you. But what if we go to the information technology, to the IT staff, the computer staff, and ask them, your users that come to your website to use your resources, what challenges do you see your users having when it comes to data? And when you ask the IT staff that, and they put it in their words, these are the kind of challenges they say they see people face or the skills challenges they see people have. So some of you here will read man pages right away at the top of the list and know exactly what that's talking about. And other people will be like, what on earth? And if you read down a little bit further, you might come across the word grepping. So the, the point of this slide here is, is to show you um, how we need navigate these spaces and, and how challenging it can be uh, to understand the, each other's needs and to ask questions because we don't necessarily have the, the words. So on that, in the Google Doc, you'll see a, our first challenge in this talk, what are your known skills needs? So if you are up for sharing today, uh, give us a, a shout out in the Google Doc and let us know what one of your known skills needs is. And if you see it's already listed there, stick a plus one by it. And again, this is an endeavor to help uh, each other see what everybody else's needs are in the room and kind of see uh, that we are a community. And a challenge uh, from me, from a broader group, to suggest the continued development of a carpentries network, uh, a workshop mentoring uh, data skills, data materials network around the globe that's available that we can tie into and could build across all the natural history collections. The Smithsonian is already doing this along with Duke, uh, Indiana University, is getting ready to do it. And I 
um, it's this is a shout out and a throwdown to the collections wor worldwide to do this. Hey Deb, two two minute warning. Thank you. From a data and technology leadership point of view, so administrators come to us and they ask us, um, can one person do this entire job of managing the data for donors, data for research, data for collections? Uh, they come to us and ask us, where should we find these people? And what kind of skills should we make sure that they have? So leadership is asking. So they're recognizing that they need help to understand what they should be planning for and what the, what the human infrastructure should be like. Um, and getting towards things like asking for dams and understanding that they need ways in which to manage their digital resources as well. So the next challenge is a throwdown to go to this lovely tool developed by the Atlas of Living Australia folks called the Digitization uh, Maturity Model. And it's a cool metrics tool that not only can you use inside your own organization to sort of look at your digitization progress uh, as an organization, but it gives you a, a really nice way in which you could benchmark across collections to help each other. Because you could say, well, we're in this area. Oh, you're in that one. What can we learn from your organization? So this is a, a challenge to all the um, leadership in the room to take this tool and apply it uh, in one of the ways it was intended to be used, uh, which is to help organizations help each other. Going along that line very quickly, we have some metrics data and there's much more than I'm sharing here. At least 90% of the respondents want to learn more about what metrics other institutions are using. And so if you're in that pile, how are we going to go forward to doing that? Are we going to have a metrics interest group? Are we going to have a workshop? If you're interested in that, um, thinking about your collection and your organization, how do you do this? And how would you benefit from uh, doing this with others? We also have a huge duplication of effort challenge, which is not only of concern at the level of the collection managers, but of course, if you're in a, playing a leadership role, this is going to be of concern to you because that's a lot of uh, human capital. And these are just some of the areas in which we see uh, repeated data across databases across the planet that we could be sharing uh, more effectively. We want round tripping. We want to be able to take advantage of the human input into our data, but we also don't want people to be uh, replicating the work over and over again. These are some projects at the bottom, Globi, Bionomia, Biodiversity Heritage Library, Wikidata, and Plazi that are helping us uh, move forward with this for things like trait data, people data, publication data. Um, and I encourage all of you to find out more about these and to help us uh, help each other figure out how not to duplicate. From a data so, fitness point, yep. Real quick, we're at the 15 minute mark, but we don't have any yep. questions yet. So I'm going to encourage our participants to ask questions in the Q&A oh, yes, if you have them. But if you don't, I think it would be wonderful to keep hearing from you, Deb. Is that all right? Yep, and I'm almost okay. done. So okay. these, are, these are quick. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So please do ask questions, y'all. You must have questions. I, I know there, there must be a million, so <laughs> ask two or three. The data fitness uh, is a big, issue and its challenge. This shows you when you share your data, um, sometimes you can see things in your data that are hard to see locally in your own database. But what do you do about that? So how are all of you assessing your data fitness as a collection manager or uh, in the leadership role? And how are you addressing the issues that you find? Uh, do you have the skills that you need? Do you have the tools that you need? And what else could we do about it? So here's the next challenge. There are a suite of tests, a suite of data fitness checks for biocollections data developed by a working group at TADWIG, the Biodiversity Information Standards Group. And it's very wonderful to know that the Atlas of Living Australia, GBIF, IDIG Bio, and DISCO that have agreed to implement those uh, at the level of aggregation. But wouldn't it be cool if they could be implemented at the level of the collection management software that we all use so that when the data went out the door to be aggregated, um, many of these issues that we talk about here would already be um, taken care of. So that's a shout out to the collection management software folks in the room 
to see about how they could do that and let us know how many of them they can uh, embed in their software. So with that, I come to my next to last slide, which is to ask you to take the Twitter challenge. And this is also in the Google Doc. If we, I We do have a question now, Deb, so oh, you, it might cool. be better to spend the last two minutes on that. Okay, that's fine. Chris, what do you is wanna? The question. I will send it off to you. It's, uh, I'm a herbarium curator at the University Focused in Science. I'd like to see museum data management become a course or major for students, possibly as joint bio biology library science major. I'd like to connect with those who are thinking about implementing this. Um, yes. <laughs> so I think that that's an a uh, very exciting possibility. And I think there are others here in the room who would also love to weigh in on that. So hopefully we'll also have more time to chat about that. We have a group we're working right now on, um, there's several groups working on things like what should the skills be uh, and be included. And it would be great to talk with you more and connect you with others who are trying to do similarly. Uh, could y'all maybe in the chat, maybe in the Google doc, maybe that's better. Um, you could put something about people who are interested in developing a course or a major and see if people can find each other there. Does anybody else have anything to add from the panelist's point of view? I think that that's a great idea, Deb, if you, um, so this was Allison Colwell from UC Davis that was asking this question. And I think if, if uh, anyone else is interested, the Google Doc is maybe a good place to connect on this topic. We okay. do just have one minute left, so I want to thank Deb so much. If you have more questions for her, you can still ask them in the Q&A and she can answer them via chat. And at this point, we're going to transition to our next speakers. So we have next, we have Gabriella Hoog and Megan McCuller from the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. Uh, they can correct me on the name of their institution if they need to. Uh, they're going to be presenting the dynamic role of collections managers and they've recorded their presentation although they are also in the room with us today but there's two of them so it's a little bit trickier to present so i am going to play that video and someone who's a panelist would you tell me if you aren't able to hear the sound when i start playing it Megan and I just wanted to talk to you a little bit today about our dynamic role as collection managers and how our roles have evolved over the years and the changes that have happened uh, within our roles. And so we just wanted to start this conversation by talking a little bit about uh, collections management and what that really means. And the basic definition of collections management is to preserve and develop uh, our collections for their long-term sustainability and while also fulfilling institutional mission statements and also making sure that our collections are applicable to what's going on today. So here you can see some images from the fish collection, which I am uh, the manager of, and from the non-molluscan invertebrates collection, which Megan managed Images. As we were putting this together, we did realize that most of our management actually happens with the data itself. Uh, and, you know, whether that be catalog books, labels, any sort of paper data, log books, field notes, we spend most of our time like this little blue person in the middle, uh, <laughs> glued to a computer, making sure that our data is all entered and that it's as research ready as possible. And that way, when it's made globally accessible, it can be used in any which way by researchers, educators, students, conservation managers, whoever that may be. So as we were thinking about the evolution of our jobs and our dynamic roles, I pulled out my um, job posting from 1997. Uh, and you can see there's a lot of things wrong with this job posting, a lot of interesting statements rather. Um, but there's some things in here that, you know, I, I did and I still do today in the basic management of the collection and its preparation, its identification and sorting and cataloging of specimens. <laughs> and recording all of that. Back in the day, our collection, uh, our fish collection was about 800,000 specimens. Today, it's about 1.4 million. And so we did not have anything in any sort of database. It was all paper data. And so I was tasked with putting it in some sort of a database. 
and at some point making that data globally accessible. And so as we looked at my role, we also pulled up um, Megan's 2018 posting. And so this is a portion of mine, and uh, it has a lot of the same wording as Gabby's, but is more detailed as to the type of tasks each duty involves. And it includes a numbered list of additional skill requirements. And the major thing that was glaringly obvious to me, and uh, both now and at the time that I was applying is number three, at the bottom there, ability to learn computer languages which uh, Gabby, of course, didn't need to know when she applied, and uh, I do now. So we wanted to do a little compare and contrast between these two postings, and not a ton is outright changed, especially regarding basic collections management duties, such as ability to ID specimens, do research, uh, databasing, outreach, that sort of thing. In terms of differences, Gabby's posting doesn't really mention grant activities as all, at all as mine does, nor does her say anything about computer languages or even specifically databasing. And as she said, it, her duty was to just like get the information somewhere. Um, mine also mentions the supervisory aspect while well, Gabby's doesn't, and she assuredly supervises a lot of volunteers, interns, and techs, certainly more than I have so far. And the last point of outreach via social media isn't really an either, but in mine it could be implied as an outreach activity, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. But the major takeaway here is that I came in with the expectation for all these additional tasks needed to complete my duties, uh, while Gabby has had to learn how to do these things over time through the years, such as databasing and learning computer languages and X, Y, and Z on the job. And so we made this flowchart together that sort of shows each of the, uh, the breakdown of our job. And at NCSM, that's sort of 50% collections management, 25% outreach, and uh, 25 percent research so each diamond corresponds to each of those things and each one is made up of all these individual duties and each of those duties is further broken down by a bunch of small little tasks that are needed to complete each one um, not shown here because space and I also included admin which can be considered its own thing and overlaps with a lot of these, but you don't often come in knowing each specific admin task that you'll need to do, and so that's something learned to fulfill each like institution's needs in that respect. So Gabby, if you want to add to that. Yeah, so one of the things we quickly realized is how overwhelming this flowchart would become if we actually sat down and put how all of these are interconnected with each other. And so we just decided to trim it down. The other thing we've realized is that each of these diamonds is a job in and of itself, if not more, and even the admin aspect of our job is, is its own job in and of itself. And then as we were talking about it, we realized that the biggest thing that we can do is try to stay up to date on the current standards, trends, and technologies, but that's on top of all of our job duties. And so as we're looking at doing this, we were thinking about the various different things that we have done to stay up to date on you know, current standards, trends, and technologies, and basically looking at, well, how can we do something with citizen science within our collections, and what are the research trends that are going on, and the different storage, and what are the, the needs within our grant applications that we need to start putting in, and the different databases and standards. And so there's so many levels of staying up to date within each of those bigger tasks and subtasks uh, within our flowchart. And so, Megan, did you want to add on to this? Yeah, so specifically for me, staying up to date is especially important when it comes to social media and societal trends, and there's a lot of overlap between those two things. Uh, these are things that collections managers aren't really required to do, and I might be biased towards them because I found my job via Twitter, but I personally think that they're very important and useful 
not just for helping you stay up to date in your own field, but just communicating what you do every day uh, can help people understand that this is a career choice and teach people about the stuff you work with or animals if you work with animals. And keeping up to date can also make you more effective at communicating by, for instance, using memes, which sort of have a window before coming out of date uh, and can be very engaging with the public. And social media also helps you stay informed about societal trends. And just using COVID as an example is how many museums who haven't been previously generating virtual content are making pushes to do so, which generally just makes things more accessible to a wider uh, diversity of, of an audience, especially to those with an admission fee. So at this point, Megan and I were like this, we had our minds blown thinking about everything that we had to do. So this is actually me and Megan with our minds blown <laughs> because, you know, look, going back to the flow chart and all those different tasks and the subtasks and all the things we didn't put in there and then thinking about staying up to date in each one of those areas caused us to really start thinking, well, how exactly do we prioritize what we're gonna do? And so we basically broke it down and really came up with these four questions. They're very broad questions and they themselves need sub questions for, for each of you individually. But in thinking about prioritization, one of the first things we thought was ask ourselves, you know, which task is the most important for the sustainability and applicability of the collection? And, and while we're looking at that task, is that the most important for the institution? And is that the most important task for my direct and indirect supervisors? And then we should also be asking ourselves, what is the most important thing for my career? Because if we start looking at all these tasks and the subtask and the subtask of the subtask, that is way more than a 40 hour work week. So it is gonna involve more than we are actually allotted at work. And so it is going to dig into our own time. So, you know, finding that perfect work-life balance, which is a, a whole nother topic in and of itself, but we really need to think about that because we need to think about what's the best thing for my career since the things that we are tasked in doing uh, re already require more than 40 hours and then staying up to date requires even more time. So how are we going to prioritize that? And we thought by asking ourselves these four broad questions that could help us to narrow it down. We can also use some of these resources that are currently available. There are tons of other resources. We could not put them all on the slide. But one of the things I want to point you to here is actually the other collections professionals. And that's something that I think is very key in order to help each other out. Uh, one of the things that um, I find amazing is when I can reach out and I can find from someone else what's worked, what hasn't worked, uh, what resources they've used that have helped them, what resources they've used that they've learned from or that they haven't learned from, and also the mentoring process. I think it's key that, especially for myself, having been a collections manager for over 20 years, it's key that I mentor those that are coming into the profession, the next generation of collections professionals, and help them in any possible way that I can because we really want to make sure that we are available and that they know of these resources that are out there because currently what we really have is this. And this image just really represents what it sort of feels like to navigate through all of these tasks we have to do in order to, to meet all of the various needs, especially to someone like me who's fairly new and doesn't know any of those resources or didn't know when I came in. So I've got the basics. I'm continuing to learn new things all the time and it often feels overwhelming. Um, and it feels like I'm piecing together things on the fly, which takes a lot of time, of course. And you get there eventually. Um, and, and my supervisor understands that these things take time, but I, I don't generally get the feeling that higher ups understand and appreciate how much time goes into each individual task. So at least for me, it can be stressful when we're uh, faced with things like having to submit metrics that are to measure specific things like how many things are you uploading into the database, which can be misleading because what if I just spent a month using OpenRefine to get that data into a workable uh, format in order to upload it to the database. So again, just just having that sort of understanding of what 
what all we do and how much time it takes. And so actually mine and Megan's sort of dream bridge looks like this. It's intertwined uh, with all of the different resources available and uh, also with the institutional support and backing. And, and also you can see that this bridge is a lot shorter because I think it should, we should try to make it as short as possible. And so one of the things that we've really been working towards is how do we make our institution understand and provide what we need in order to help us keep up with the latest standards and trends Friends. And what we'd like to do is really start a dialogue because in order for us to get to this point, we need to hear from everyone in. So we'd really love to start a dialogue with everybody. So here's our contact information. We'd like to hear what has worked for you at your institution, what hasn't worked, uh, what resources you've used that are worked, and and what you would like to see as resources that are out there. You know, it's key that we start providing this information, especially as Megan said, for those that are coming in and don't necessarily know what is even available to them out there. And they may be coming into an institution and they may be the only collections manager at an institution. So there's not even anybody there that they can reach out to. So let's start a dialogue and let's let um, the, our institutions know and others know how dynamic our jobs as collection managers really are. So thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Well, that was an excellent talk. Thank you so much, Megan and Gabby. Uh, I think we had at least one question and yes. if anybody yes. else, go ahead, uh, go for it, Chris. Megan, there is a question uh, from Ron Mader. What's the key takeaways to improving public engagement with biodiversity in 2020? Um, so I would, again, I'm biased uh, towards social media, but I've found that people can be very engaged via social media. Um, and I use specifically Twitter mostly because I have a hard time putting my focus into a bunch of different social medias and that's worked pretty well for me. Um, but if you just look at accounts like Sue the T-Rex or even Monterey Bay Aquarium accounts, those are super popular for tons of people. I mean, they've got thousands of followers and they, they create just general content for everybody. And if we do stuff like that, people get interested in in those things whether they're coming to those physical locations or not um, especially now when people are just looking for educational content so that that would be my answer <laughs> Gabby might have a different one no, I think that's great. I think one of the other things to add is to make it accessible in the sense of showing people that we're just regular people. Like you don't have to be anything special to be a collections manager, a collections professional, or, you know, anybody can attain this. And I think that that's huge because um, for so long, we've been so siloed that I think it's good to show people, hey, we're at home too, here I am, here's my cat, here's my dog, whatever's going on. And so uh, just making it real for people and, um, and like I said, accessible and also um, allowing, you know, people to know, like, hey, I'm here if you have other questions too. So, you know, while we're posting on social media, um, opening ourselves up to being available um, for people for further questions or even like we mentioned in our talk for mentoring, which I think is key uh, to bringing in um, people into our profession. Uh, we've got a question. Um, we've got a person with their hand up uh, in the panelist discussion in the sorry attendees WYK. Uh, can Can you type in your oops. Hands down. Okay, um, I've got another question here. Um, what are the examples of good institutional support? What are examples of ways your institution can support uh, collection managers better? Collection managers better. Uh, that's a good question, um, and I I'm not sure I can really answer. I mean, I guess I would answer. It'd be great if. Um, leadership would 
I don't know, sit in and, and see what we do or just talk with us in person, spend, you know, a few hours or a day with collections managers. And I think it's hard to answer too, because I mean, when I was interviewing for the job I'm in, I asked all the collections managers what their average day looks like and nobody could give me a straight answer, which actually works out really well but it's just because there's so many tasks that we can do. You can really work around that. Of course, you have to meet those various um, uh, priorities, but if you don't have any pressing priorities, stuff just needs to get done, a lot of it. So you can work your day around those things. Um, so it could look a little or unorganized. So I'm not sure exactly how to answer that. And we'd be interested in getting feedback from people here, collections managers or uh, people in leadership positions in the Google Doc. I just wasn't really sure what to label that there. I've I put a thing in there and say what has or hasn't worked. Um, if anybody has suggestions on a better header for that, then <laughs> feel free to edit. I can chime into the institutional support. A couple things I can think of is number one, great institutional support is allowing you to go to professional meetings so you can have that uh, development, um, especially spinach, I think is a phenomenal meeting to go to every year and to sort of target as a collections professional to be at. One of the other things I think that make it's good for institutional support is to work with collections manager to develop the metrics. So not just kind of throw some metrics numbers at collections management, but say, hey, what are the metrics that can really tell us what's going on in your collection or you know, with the research happening with your collection? So working together and creating, you know, like we were thinking about that intertwined bridge, right? I think that a lot of times um, institutions have sort of their donor mentality on those, which is understandable, but those metrics for donors aren't necessarily the metrics that are going to showcase the collection. And so I think it's key to um, work together to have that. And then really, as Megan was saying, just provide the time to come and talk and understand what's actually happening in the collection, to learn about the collection, to be interested in the collection. So those are some of the things I can think about um, as far as institutional support. I am so sorry I'm going to cut off this conversation here because as somebody said in the chat earlier, it really does seem like a little bit of therapy. Um, but, but I think that uh, there's, that was a wonderful talk and I want to thank Gabriella and Megan. And with that, we are going to transition to our next speaker. So Sylvia Orley is at the Smithsonian and she'll be talking about collection management in a changed digital landscape, progress and challenges for the US herbarium with a newly digitized collection. And I will be sharing her slides. So Sylvia, let me know if this doesn't look good. Do you see uh, your yeah, slides? Looks, looks really good. You can okay. hear me? I can hear you great. Take great. it away. Okay, I'll give you a thanks. two minute warning. Okay. Um, well, let me just say that last night I had a, a nightmare that um, I was trying to give the Zoom talk, but for some reason I couldn't spell the word Gmail. And um, I spent 15 minutes trying to spell Gmail. And I, I don't know why that like scared me to death that I couldn't give this talk. So I, I think now um, that I realize that I can spell Gmail, this will all go well. So it's, it's all good. Um, I wanted to, let me introduce myself. I'm digitization manager for the US Herbarium at the Natural History Museum at Smithsonian uh, in Washington, DC. And originally I was going to talk about uh, what has happened to collections management in our herbarium um, with a newly digitized collection. And uh, we are nearly, I think we're over 80% digitized at this point meaning that we have not just a digital record for our, uh, our press specimens, but uh, also uh, a, a, an image of each sheet. So it's, uh, it's going very well and, and very quickly. Um, can I have the next slide? But the thing is that, oh, 
my back. I, the, the thing is, I actually changed the talk uh, because of what has happened with COVID-19 and how that's really changed what has been happening at the Smithsonian, at Natural History Museum, and specifically in the Department of Botany. Uh, next slide. So let me tell you a little bit about the U.S. herbarium. We are a herbarium of about 5 million collections and 4 million of those are pressed plant specimens. And we, in, back in 2015, we started using a digitization conveyor belt uh, run by the company, uh, the Dutch company uh, Pictora. And they, uh, digit they have been digitizing with us for the last five years. And we've managed to uh, image um, a little under uh, 3 million uh, plant specimens and also create 2.1 million label transcriptions in five years. And if anybody knows about data, that's just a, a huge amount of data and a very short amount of time. And so we've just had a, an avalanche of uh, record data coming at us, um, sometimes up to uh, 30 to 40,000 records per month. Next slide. Originally, I was going to talk about how this has affected collection management duties at the Natural History Museum. One thing I, I wanted to uh, first mention is that the U.S. Herbarium at one point back in, uh, you know, 40, 50 years ago was a very uh, loan intensive uh, uh, department, meaning that we were sending and receiving loans at any time. And at the time, in uh, 1980, we would be sending out hundreds of loans at, in any year. And with those hundreds of loans, the uh, loan, the number of, of specimens in each loan would be about maybe between 100 and 150, or I'm sorry, 100 to 200, sometimes 400 specimens in one loan, just a huge amount of material uh, coming and going uh, from the museum. But however, since we've been able to put our collections online, now that has precipitately, precipitously dropped. And you can see on the uh, chart on the right-hand side that in 2011, we had sent out 140 uh, specimen loans. And now in 2019, last time we were able to count for the full year, uh, that number has dropped down to 40. Also, really importantly, we have dropped down, um, the number of specimens per loan has dropped from an average of 150 down to less than 50, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, wait, I think it's actually uh, 20 um, per loan. So people that are wanting loans are being very specific about what they want. They, they are able to look online and they say, oh, well, I'd like that specimen and this specimen. And they actually send us the barcode numbers and we send out those loans. One thing uh, that has shot up significantly, um, while we're not sending the entire specimen out, we are actually um, now uh, doing quite a bit of destructive sampling, meaning that we are taking a piece off of the specimen. And that is mostly because, again, there, people are able to see the specimens online. Uh, but second of all, there's a lot of genetic sampling going on now. It's something that we, um, you know, 20 years ago, we certainly weren't doing. The next thing that's been very um, important has really increased the level of responsibility for collections managers is the expectation of accountability. Um, not only are we expected to say where the permitting is coming from, from each accession that we get, but we're also expected to be able to count exact numbers of our uh, collections at any one time. So the dependence on the collections data is really high. There's also a high expectation of availability of our specimen data and accessibility. So meaning that not only is it available, but it's easy, easy to get, that it's, it's, being, um, uh, it, it's being given on a regular basis to uh, data aggregators as well. Then that's expected now on a, not just a, a six month basis, or, but a, a new upload was uh, uploaded every week. So uh, it's adding quite a bit of um, strain onto the staff to make sure the data is ready and available, but also the data itself needs to be of high quality, no mistakes. And everyone is now expecting an image, which is 
interesting because uh, you know, 10 years ago, nobody would have expected or could even have an online image, but now that is something that um, if, if there is no uh, image available for a specimen record, uh, people are asking why. So that's, that's, a, new, um, that's a new thing altogether. Uh, can I have the next slide? Let me talk a little bit about COVID-19 and the emergency that happened in, uh, in uh, mid, mid March. And that was that, you know, with, and of course this was happening to everyone throughout the country, but in Washington, DC, uh, we were effectively given two working days to uh, pack up and leave the museum and start teleworking. And that was the entire Smithsonian. Uh, very few Smithsonian staff were left in the buildings uh, after uh, being warned, given a two-day warning. And all the work must be conducted at home, at a stay-at-home order. And the stay-at-home order meant you stay at home. You don't, uh, you're not going out and about, you're not going shopping, you're not going to the rec center. Everything was shut down um, and you were expected to stay where you were. And that meant that all work had to be conducted at home. And the, the guidelines are very strict for DC, um, not so much for Maryland and Virginia where a lot of the museum people live. However, the Smithsonian was following the DC guidelines and all federal and trust staff, which is the staff of the Smithsonian, uh, were working under a telework emergency designation at the time. Next slide. So that, it was very interesting because Originally, the, really the only way to access, uh, to telework in the Smithsonian was to uh, go through their Citrix system, which was only available to a very few number of people. Um, somehow, the Smithsonian managed to pull uh, out of their hat a telework system um, for anybody who had a network account. This is kind of amazing to me because this the, the Smithsonian managed to create this, or maybe they were working on it for a very long time, but somehow it became available a few days before the Smithsonian entirely shut down. The great thing about this was it allowed us remote access to our work computers. So we really weren't uh, actually, we were actually able to work at home on our work computers, which made a big difference. And um, we were given a full scale of application, full scale menu of applications. In addition, Natural History at Botany created an emergency plan where all collection staff were given long-term long online catalog duties, uh, whatever it might be, transactions, working with collection records, et cetera, et cetera, so that nobody would be sitting idle. Um, everyone had something to do. And another important uh, part of the department are our, our vendors or contractors that work with us. I mean, they are people that are under contract, but basically they are part of the staff. We didn't want to lose these people and we certainly didn't want them to be unemployed. So we created all sorts of new contracts for them um, for data catalog teleworking. And these contracts were renewable on an eight week basis so that, um, you know, in, in case that the uh, stay at home orders and the, in case the Smithsonian started letting people back in the building, uh, we would be able to, the, the contractors would be able to finish these contracts out um, or we would be able to cancel the contracts without too much, uh, too mu too much uh, damage from uh, con uh, canceling contracts too early. Can I have the next slide? So we had to really quickly switch from physical on-site work, which you see on the left, where you know we're creating uh, new foldering, you know, we're uh, curating the specimens, we're uh, doing press plant type of work, you know, everything that goes on with collections management. Uh, switching to everyone being virtual and off-site. Next slide. Now the one thing that I know that uh, we have and it just a ton of work in is data cleanup. And especially when we've had this avalanche of data coming to us from um, the transcription part of uh, Pictura. And a lot of times, as many of you know, uh, collection labels are extremely hard to read. And the people that were transcribing the labels um, from the pressed plant specimens uh, actually were from Suriname. Uh, English is not their first language. Actually, Dutch is the language they speak in Suriname. So we were um, 
getting basically transcriptions from people who may or may not know the languages for what they are transcribing. Um, and you can see on the, in the middle, there's a bunch of words that are, uh, they have uh, asterisks next to them. That, that means that the transcribers couldn't uh, necessarily read those those words and those therefore we need to clean up all the data that has those asterisks to make sure that those words are actually correct. So there's just an enormous amount of work to be done cleaning up these asterisks and this is what I decided we needed to concentrate on because I didn't want the data online to show with a lot of um, uh, messy sort of asterisks everywhere saying um, you know interpreted this was interpreted, that was interpreted. It doesn't really inspire faith in the data when you have a lot of that. Um, so uh, yeah, next slide. That's this good. is a, just a two minute warning. Oh gosh, oh, sorry. Okay, so next thing is that what I decided to do was to um, batch the records up uh, by collector because the, if you can start reading one collector's handwriting then uh, it's good that you stick with that the, the batches were with one collector, uh, one or two collectors at a time or three, uh, just to keep the handwriting and the localities uh, together in one batch. And then I assigned the, the uh, staff and vendors um, these various batches of collector records that needed to be cleaned up. And each batch was worth about um, two weeks of work and each contract for the contractors was for batches so that everyone had the same amount of work to do. Next slide. By doing this type of batched work and by switching everyone over to uh, data cleanup, we had 13 collections and IT staff for contractors working on data cleanup. And uh, in just a three month period, we were able to fix over half a million specimen records in the data catalog, which was great. The interesting thing is that uh, Smithsonian still has not gone back to work. We're still teleworking. The expectation that we will go back to work on a normal basis is many months away. It may be the fall or even later, maybe even January before we are looking at uh, a full workplace again. And uh, right now we're just working on a phased re-entrance into the museum. And so it looks as if at least for the next half year, telework will be the standard of workplace and so we really have to think about you know how are we going to keep busy um, during this time and it, it really requires that we be very strategic about what we do next slide okay so i just wanted to say you know the, from my perspective the the requirements for a digital telework readiness is that there be of course a, a robust telework system in place that there would be a data catalog that you can work with and you can batch easily. And that uh, we're working with EMU, which actually has a very uh, robust batching system. So that works well. But the, the most important thing is that you have an executive staff uh, with your museum or with your institution that's really willing to switch people over to this type of telework because it's really important that we keep staff on and make sure that, it's, that people, it's understood that collections work is really important and relevant during this fiscal time. On the right hand side, the graph shows that during this time of uh, COVID, our specimen queries really went up online. That, um, our online catalog was searched significantly higher. And that is because people are home and very dependent on our digital records and, um, and, and I'm really glad that this, the Natural History Museum understood the value of keeping everybody uh, at work and under contract to keep this work going and, and I thank them for doing that because it's just been a really great way to keep our staff going and motivated and employed. Uh, so uh, next slide. So if you have any questions, please reach out and, um, or you wanna talk about this and uh, our, my contact information is here. So thanks, appreciate it. Thank you so much, Sylvia. And I think uh, there's been a lot going on in the chat while you've been talking about all of this. Uh, so I, I know people were really engaged. Um, I don't know if we have any questions specifically for Sylvia yet, but I'll let Chris handle that. Yeah, right now we've got um, a bunch of chat going on about social media. Um, 
if someone has a question specifically for this talk, if they want to raise their hand or um, quickly type it in the Q&A, we can get it um, off. Sylvia, I was wondering in that last slide where you were showing the uptick in people searching the Smithsonian's catalog during COVID, was that just for botany or was that across collections? That, that was that was just for botany. Yeah. Um, and I can imagine that it's the same for most collections because, uh, <laughs> you know, um, I'm sure that most other um, departments are you know, the, the same type of situation. Uh, Sylvia, you've got a question here in the Q&A. Uh, did you get a significant improvement in the data quality during this time, during the COVID time? Uh, yeah, I mean, that, that was our, our, our big push. Uh, again, I was trying to fix our precise locality records, mostly uh, the precise localities were a mess. And so I, again, we, we improved a good, significant number, but it, uh, when I did the total tally, it was about over half a million records were fixed in one way or another. Did you also, there's another question coming in from Lauren Gardner, what kind of proportion of the, what proportion of their transcribed records from the master digitization work needed a, um, much manual checking and work? That's, that's a great question. Um, I mean, it, I would say at least 10%. So if we we're looking at 40,000 records coming in every month, then it was about 4,000 records needed to be fixed or cleaned up in one way or another. And then we have another quick follow-up. Um, given the success of the cleanup over the last months, does this change your priorities or how you'll manage folks on uh, time when and if your department goes back to work in person? Yeah, I, well, I think actually what it's done is, a, is taken that burden off of our back. It's that when we go back to work, we'll finally be able to start working on more so worrying about this backlog of uh, dirty data, so to speak. Yeah. And there's one other question. Did you use any crowdsourcing to help with transcription? I actually did. Um, one thing that we had, uh, the Smithsonian Transcription Center uh, allows us to have various kinds of projects. And I had one project where if there were unknown countries from the labels, a lot of times, the, the, sometimes the labels, you just don't know what country these uh, specimens are from. So I would, and I still am putting up batches of about um, 500 to 1000 unknown country labels that I have volunteers helping me figure out what country these labels are from. And that has, especially in the time of COVID has been really successful. I mean, I'm, we're basically going through one, uh, one batch of these uh, unknown, label, unknown country labels every week. That's and great. And I, I, wait, wait, I'm unfortunately going to cut us off so that we can stick to our time. Um, you thank it. you so much, Sylvia. And there is at least one more question that maybe you could answer in the chat. Okay, great. Thanks. So Anton, would you like to share your screen? Yes. So next we have Anton Gunch from the Botanic Garden and the Botanic Garden in Berlin. Again, correct me on your institution. I'm not going to get it all right. And Anton is presenting today on Better Together, merging our knowledge about people, places, collections, and taxonomies with wiki data. With that, I will turn it over to you. We can see your presentation and it looks good. Thank you. Uh, well, my presentation is actually um, a continuation of a discussion uh, the authors had during a Wikidata workshop, uh, which took place in Warsaw uh, in February. And uh, we were all in a breakout group talking about uh, to what extent collection data can be maintained together, for example, in a Wikidata environment. And uh, I would like to continue this discussion here. Uh, but before doing so, I would perhaps start with a little bit of history. And when I'm saying history, I'm, I mean my own brief history of collection data management, which started around the year 1998, um, where I started to work for the Botanic Garden in Berlin. And at that time, um, I can safely say that data management was largely carried out locally by institutions. 
uh, which were running dozens, many dozens of individual software solutions ranging from spreadsheets to little databases or more elaborated database solutions, all kinds of things uh, which were used in collections. And usually they had very restrictive uh, data publication policy, or you could say it was generally uh, not accepted that data sharing is a good idea. This changed a little bit uh, and 10 years later, uh, many institutions started to cooperate in software development and cooperation could mean that collections started to reuse existing software and to stop their local developments. But also some collections got together to uh, develop software collaboratively themselves and some of them from scratch and uh, some used existing open source solutions and developed that further or tailored them for their specific needs. So there was, they, they really started to cooperate on these software systems. How is it today? Uh, we developed the thing even further um, in a way that collections start to share databases and software platforms in a way that they are working to the same systems, not only using the same software, but working into the very same systems. And uh, I would say outstanding example for this approach is the Herbarium data management system, Jacques, uh, which is used by presently, I think about 50 Herbarium collections, which use a single shared database, which is uh, hosted at the Natural History Museum in Vienna. And there are several synchronized copies of this um, database in European collections. And you see here a map of the participating herbaria, only the mainly the European part, but there are also herbaria outside of Europe using, using this Jacques system. And this has obviously many advantages. For example, core data types can be maintained jointly and uh, most prominently the scientific names can be maintained uh, jointly, but also all kinds of controlled vocabularies, uh, uh, place names, all the things you can do together can be done together in those single databases. You can harmonize data input procedures in a way that everybody follows the same rules, which makes the data more reliable from a user perspective. You can reuse already existing data, which is in particularly important for herbaria, for example, in the case of duplicates, where you can just reuse the data uh, instead of entering data uh, again and again, the same data again and again. And uh, finally, you can share and harmonize your data publication techniques, for example, the networking components you uh, need to feed data into GBIF, BioCase and, and other international data publishing frameworks. But those data are still local to the consortia. They can only be seen or linked by collections, for example, for Jacques within the Jacques uh, consortium. Uh, so they are not reusable uh, on a global level. So the question is, can we go further? Can we, for example, jointly maintain certain data types in the public domain and link, just link them locally? And uh, the most important example for this approach at present is person data. It has been mentioned uh, earlier by Deb, I think. Um, collections have started to maintain person data on Wikidata and just link the data in their local collections um, using the Wikidata ID. And the picture here you see is from last year from the Biodiversity Next uh, con conference where we had a workshop uh, dealing exactly with this approach. This is an example of a Wikidata page for a collector. Uh, his name is Richard Spruce from the 19th century. And as you can see, all his biography data and all kinds of other data are maintained on a publicly available Wikidata page. Everybody can add to this page or correct information on this page. And um, he receives 
received this identifier, the so-called Q number, and this number can be reused in local collections. And this is a, a specimen page of the Jacques system I mentioned before, um, and this specimen has been collected by Richard Spruce, and as you can see, we have only the name here and the link to Wikidata. And why is this good? If we now click on the Wikidata on this link, we get all kinds of information around this collector, which we don't have to capture ourselves anymore. And these data include the biography from Wikidata itself. We get publications from BHL, for example, and we get specimens from different collections who annotated their specimens with this Q number. So it's a whole world which, which opens up just by using this number. The advantages of this approach are, are many. Um, for example, duplicated work in data maintenance is avoided. We can improve the data quality because many people are editing the same record. Um, we can easily integrate additional information resources, just as I said before, BHL, other resources. Uh, and practically, we are, we are creating a common information space across all collections. So the question is now, can we extend this approach to other data types as well? What about places, place names, um, which are centrally available, for example, via geo names? What about scientific names, taxonomic concepts? all kinds of controlled vocabularies, collections, collection entities. And much of this has already been addressed in working groups. Um, and I'm, I'm thinking we are making progress here very much. But if you look at the list uh, of data types I've, I've listed here, there's actually not much things remaining, uh, which then, if we have achieved this, would be have to maintain uh, locally. So the question is, can we perhaps go even further and give up our local collection management, move it into the public domain, and only very little data would stay locally, such, such as data about storage of specimens, loans, and so forth. That's a difficult question. I don't have an answer, really. But I made a little experiment. and. Uh, the experiment was uh, two years ago in a meeting of the Consortium of U European Taxonomic Facilities. And there's a group uh, dealing with uh, information science um, um, issues and uh, which also contains many curators of the collections. And in the meeting, there were 30 members uh, present. And um, I just asked them whether they find the idea of maintaining collection data in the public domain for example, by using Wikidata, interesting and whether it should be investigated further. And actually, when I asked the question, I expected that, let's say, 50% would be mildly interested. And uh, the surprise was quite big that almost everybody in the room said, yes, this is an interesting approach and uh, we should... Uh, research, do a little bit more research on the topic and, and, and try to do something about it. And uh, yeah, that's why I give, I'm giving this talk here because I want to ask the question to, to you. I, I would like to leave it at that for now. The question remains, can we manage our data much more openly from the ground up? I would say yes. And yeah, I would be interested to hear your thoughts about it. That's it for now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anton. Uh, if anybody has questions for Anton, you can either put them in the Q&A or uh, raise your hand and Chris will call on you. We've had lots of stuff going by in the chat uh, in support of all your ideas that you've been presenting on. And then I have a quick question for you, just directly, sorry. Um, what, did you have any pushback with regard to uh, sensitive data for conservation concerns being dealt with in this way? Um, things that are endangered, uh, whatnot? Thanks. Yeah, we've, we've, we, uh, we spoke about it, uh, of course. Um, and actually, that's, it, it's not an issue, actually, because um, 
uh, you can, at any point, you can hold uh, data back. If you are, for example, uh, if you have concerns uh, um, with publishing um, uh, coordinate data with a certain specimen, for example, just hold it back. Nobody can enforce you to enter sensitive data in, in Wikidata, for example. Um, and we've got a question from Fedor Steeman. Um, I've unmuted him. Fedor, can you ask your question? I don't Hello? see him hearing. Hello? Fedor, yes? Can you yes. ask your question? Yeah, yeah, about the uh, suggestion that um, uh, we should just drop local collection management systems database systems in favor of a, a an open uh, solution uh, i think it's hard enough for you know to get senior collection managers and curators to start you know using database systems to begin with because they have seen systems come and go over decades uh, of, of attempts at digitization so we should be really careful you know uh, uh, signaling that this you know, all these efforts happening all around the world on different institutions is also just another transitional phase, and then we're going to swap it out to something completely different again, like the open, uh, you know, uh, outsource. Uh, yeah, opening it up as suggested. So that was just my my five cents. Thank you. Are there any other questions? If you have a question, you can type it into the Q and A area or raise your hand. Um, There are a few questions in the Q&A. Sorry, I didn't see those down there. Um, let's see, um, I'll just re re read these. How do you envision encumbered data from material in the public domain holding? I think we just talked about that a little bit. Um, uh, we've got a question. One of the problems I see is what constitutes the correct scientific name I work in birds and there is multiple authorities putting out what they consider the correct name, often three names for the same species. I maintain my correct name, but when I submit my data to an aggregator, they change names unilaterally without maintaining what I consider the correct name. Any thoughts on this? Yes, uh, that's, um, I mean, the, the, the general question is, uh, how, how are we dealing with contradicting opinions? Um, that's correct. This, is, this can be a problem in particular in wiki-based solutions. There are so-called wiki fights going on for decades. Um, from my point of view, um, those situations are rare. I, in, in most cases, there's not much overlap in expertise, actually, in, in, in particular in taxonomy. <laughs> and. Um, if we have such cases, a system such as Wikidata can reflect the discussion. There are discussion pages linked to wiki pages, which can reflect the different opinions about, for example, uh, taxonomic uh, questions. So there are solutions for this, but the problem is there. Yes, definitely. And you also have a question sim on a similar vein. Uh, what about common or national language in the database area um, as an example of standardization? What could the could be the rules or in practice? How would you decide if using English in your herbarium database or your national language? So about the general language of the database. I mean, Wikidata is from the ground up multilingual. If you if you if you are looking into Wikidata pages, you will see that the same information is often reflected in in different languages. So this doesn't break anything. It's in, the contrary, it's actually supporting exactly this multilingual approach. Okay. That seems to be, uh, here we get, uh, that's all the questions I see right now. If anyone has another question. There's some, there are some comments in the general chat window um, 
And it looks like we do have one more question now in the Q&A. Uh, there we go. Uh, using the same system critically depends on being able to use the same data model to represent what you want to represent and to answer the questions you want to get answered. How do you get there? That's correct, definitely. Um, I believe that for 90% of the model, there is no, actually there's no need to use different uh, data models. The basic concepts are the same. Uh, if we need for specific uh, needs uh, differing data models, you, you can keep them locally, actually. That's the, the vision would be that agreed parts of the model would go into the public domain and specific things would remain locally. I do see some comments about uh, comments in there about uh, legal problems for local, private, personal, sensitive data becoming globalized. Have you had to deal with that? Yeah, we, we would need to find example. We had the, pro the problem of, uh, of sensitive uh, data already discussed, um, for example, for protected species and so forth. Um, for, for, uh, for other data types, I, actually, I can't see a problem. I mean, we are, we are publishing almost all of our data to GBIF already, for example. Um, so actually, I can't see much difficulties here. Do you, and as I said before, you can always hold data back. If you're for some reason, for example, if it's, if it's uh, data about unpublished work, which you want to hold back, just do it. That's not the point, actually. You can do it. There's one more question here. How do you handle pulling data from Wikidata data if you want to incorporate that data on a local website rather than just a link? Is there a way to scrape some of the data to incorporate in a richer context? Yeah, Wikidata has an, has an API, an application programming interface, uh, which you can integrate into local portals. That's possible. Well, this is a good time to take a break and transition to our next speaker. Thank you so much, Anton. I think you are getting a few other comments in the Q&A, so if you want to um, type answers to those, please feel free. Uh, Ellie, would you like to share your screen? And I'll also just say as we're transitioning that Deb mentioned in the chat that the annual TADWIG meeting, which is happening in the fall, will have a couple sessions on Wikidata and these topics. So that might be a good place for people who are interested in this to learn more. That looks great to me, Ellie. So up okay. next, we have with us Ellie Wallace from CSIRO. She will be presenting on interpreting data quality or how collections can approach providing usable, useful and usable data. So you can take it away. Thank you very much. So good morning or good evening, because that's uh, what it is here in Australia. So the first thing I'd like to do is to acknowledge the tr traditional owners of the land which I'm speaking from which is the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. And I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. So I work at the Atlas of Living Australia, which is, and I'm based in Melbourne, Australia. I joined the Atlas two years ago after 24 years um, at Museums Victoria here in Melbourne. Having joined in 1995 as a collection manager with a job description, which is very similar to Gabriella's as she described earlier. So um, as we've already heard from um, a number of people, as we know those words, everyone working in collections will know that the data that we work with is not perfect. Errors creep in when the data is transcribed from label to database and at many other points in the data life cycle. Um, so what I'd like to do today is to discuss data quality from one particular, particular aspect. We've already heard about um, uh, that there are many, there are many other tools um, from Excel through to OpenRefine that you can use to clean up your data. Um, so this uh, will just give you another um, kind of approaches, set of approaches to consider uh, that might be useful to you as well. Um, so I'll just skim the surface in my short time and hopefully provide you with a few resources along the way. And that's not 
moving for some reason. There we go. Okay, so, um, so GBIF uh, has been mentioned a number of times already. Uh, it's the Global Biodiversity Aggregator that now has uh, 1.4 billion occurrence records in it. Uh, but I'm mostly not going to be talking about GBIF today and instead talking about the project that I work with, which is the Atlas of Living Australia. I'll also refer to it just as the Atlas or sometimes as ALA. Uh, so I hope you can keep up with that. The Atlas, like GBIF, provides free online ac access to more than 87, um, to biodiversity occurrence data and more than 87 million occurrence records with a focus on collections coming from Australia. So the 87 million occurrence records comprise about 12.8 million vouchered specimens from museums, herbaria and university collections. And that's around 15% of the records. Um, a much larger contribution is actually made up by records derived from human observations. So these make up 79% of the records and one single provider, uh, which is uh, a provider of observations of birds coming from BirdLife Australia, uh, con contributes 13% of the records in the Atlas, which is nearly as many records as the whole collecting sector combined. So, but what about the quality of all of this data? So what I'd like to discuss is the issue of evidence versus data, as these things both have a bearing on data quality and on what we can actually fix about the occurrence records. So it can be easy to make assumptions about what categories of records or what types of records will be counted as good records or bad records when it comes to data quality. And we can drop in, into some um, sort of slightly lazy thinking. We need to consider both the quality of the evidence and the quality of the data. So collections rely very heavily on their specimens as to provide evidence of the collection event. Specimens make very good evidence because you can keep going back to them. You can examine them re repeatedly. You can take samples from them and then analyse those samples, which can then provide further data such as sampling tissues for genetic analysis. So this specimen, for example, from Museums Victoria's collection is well preserved but the data that comes with it would now be described as pretty poor because the only data that we have is that this butterfly was collected in 1792 in China. And there's no way we can go back to 1792 to collect better data, unless I don't know something. In the case of observations, which as we heard earlier, provide more records to the Atlas than the collection sector does, the most common source of evidence at the moment for an observational record is a photograph, either taken by a person or more commonly now by a machine, such as a camera trap. And increasingly, the evidence also comes from other sources, such as sound files. So photographs, um, can, I have, photographs can provide excellent evidence, but the two examples I've shown here are not doing that. And there are certainly some extremely talented photographers out there who are observing things from the natural world. But photographs can also be poor evidence of the species observed. And here are some examples. On the left, we have a blurry image of a face of a kangaroo who appears to be sniffing at a static mounted camera. On the right, we have an image of a bird high up in a tree and the bird is barely distinguishable in silhouette from the street lamp that's also shown. But even if the evidence is poor, as these two photographs suggest, data can still be good. The locality data and the time data may still well be very well recorded. So one of the challenges with observations is that you can't go back and get better evidence, but you may have quite good data or very good data. It's kind of the reverse of the previous example where you might have good evidence, but you can't go back to 1792 to find out in China where that butterfly was flying. But there's not much you can do when you've got both poor evidence and poor data. And there's one issue that automated data quality tests, such as are run in, the, in GBIF and the Atlas, uh, are very, very poor at picking up. And that's where the species itself is misidentified. And particularly so if the image is poor as well, like this image, which is of a spider web in a tree, not that you can see it very well, but it's identified in the system as a desert wolf spider. This type of spider, desert wolf spider, doesn't live in a web to start with. And the record was observed in Sydney, so the locality data says it was Sydney, which is certainly not a desert. And there's not much we can do with this record as both the evidence and the data are poor. 
when records like this are found, it's helpful to annotate the record in the aggregator uh, to provide a clue to others that there's a problem. Um, scary spider coming up, just a warning. This is what this spider actually looks like. It lives in a burrow on the ground and is found in the red deserts of Australia. It looks big and scary in this photo, but the species is actually only about two centimetres or about an inch long. So that's small by Australian standards, nothing to worry about with that one. And as an aside, at the, Atlas of, the Atlas of Living Australia is very aware of uh, the problems that misidentified species have in, in aggregated data sets because uh, they taint the data and make it less able to be reused. So that's one reason why last year we became members of the iNaturalist network. So iNaturalist allows people to upload their sightings and seek help with the identification, which improves the quality of the data coming into the Atlas and does make it more usable. But I digress. Back to my main point. So humans are very good at spotting misidentifications and humans are also pretty good at spotting other errors as well. If you plot all of the occurrences that are, uh, have been loaded into the atlas of a single species onto a map as I've done here for the Australian magpie, you're almost certain to be able to easily spot some records that at very least should be checked. In the case of magpies, this map shows that there are some aquatic magpies that are a bit lost off the coast of Australia and also very lost off the coast of Japan. Our human eyes can easily detect that these are likely to be in the wrong place. From experience, the most common reason for any Australian species to be swimming off the coast of Japan, and we do find quite a lot of them, is simply that the negative sign has been left off the latitude, an easy error to fix. The ALA and GBIF perform a series of data quality tests and assertions that are, uh, are done on all data records as they're uploaded. So you can look for the results of these tests on every occurrence record, and there'll be a summary either at the bottom or up um, on the side of the record, depending on which, uh, which aggregator you're looking at. Some of the tests can be used to find records that could be checked. The tests look broadly at three aspects of the data, the scientific name, the place, and the time. As I said a minute ago, the Atlas doesn't do any automated testing on whether or not the identification is accurate, but we can test whether the name supplied as the identification is a correctly formed scientific name and whether or not it's one that we recognise in the taxonomic backbone used in the Atlas. There are also tests to indicate whether the time-based or temporal data is good. And a whole, a third class of tests relate to a whole raft of tests designed to indicate whether the geospatial data are accurate, provided are accurate and trusted. So collection managers um, who are looking to do some data cleaning projects uh, while we're all stuck at home uh, can use the results of these tests to identify records that need to be looked at and to give you, give you pointers about where the data could be improved. Where do you find the tests? When you do a search in the Atlas, the data quality tests appear under the assertions category on the search results page. So you can look across your search results for records that are flagged for certain tests, go back to your original data and fix errors as you find them. The Atlas makes an interesting assumption because they assume that users will know that the data is of variable quality and will filter out the records that are not fit for, for their purpose. So they assume, the Atlas assumes that uh, a user may not want very old records, for example, and exclude them, or may want to exclude all of the observation records. But from looking at how users actually use the aggregators like the Atlas and GBIF, we know that the assumption that users will filter their search results is not always the case. So the Atlas is currently working on a data quality project that will run at least until the end of this year. One of the first things that's been developed is a set of pre-filters that automatically turn records off from the search results without the user needing to do it. So without the need for the user to filter. This development is in response to users providing feedback that they know a record is incorrect, such as the spider web example I showed earlier. And they just want it, they just want to get rid of it. Don't want to see it anymore, make it go away. This new functionality will allow users to do just that. In fact, it, allow, it will allow users to have poor data quality records off by default, by, by however they happen to define poor, so that they need to manually turn the records back on. We're gonna be launching this feature into production in the next few weeks, and we're very keen to receive feedback on it. 
The other thing that we're very keen to uh, receive feedback on is that what we're discovering is that there are some of the data quality tests that were written um, back when the Atlas was first put together actually aren't working all that well. They're not measuring what this, we thought they were measuring or they um, um, have need to be tweaked or they're not uh, using a good reference set. So if you find a data quality uh, test that maybe your records should have failed and didn't or um, records that are failing and shouldn't have, if you could let us know, we'd be really, really grateful. If oh, you happen to be using- two minute warning. Okay. If you, in, if you happen to be working in GBIF rather than the Atlas, uh, what you want to use is the, the issues and flags filter, uh, issues and flags uh, to have a look across your data set for problems that might be able to be fixed. In GBIF across the Australian data, there are certain common errors affecting many, many records. One of the easiest records to pick up that occurs in lots of data sets is shown as this heavier dot in the ocean off the coast of Africa. This is the zero zero point. It's on the equator and on the prime meridian. Having a zero latitude and a zero longitude actually affects across the whole Australian data set over 22,000 records. So it's a quite a significant issue and worth going in data set by data set to, uh, to try to fix. Other commonly failed data tests, are, failed tests, occur when organisations don't supply a particular piece of data as part of their Darwin Core export. For museums and herbaria, a very commonly missed data element is whether the record is for a presence or an absence, because of course it's a presence record. We're a museum, we're a herbarium. So simply adding that one piece of data can improve a whole lot of records. And GBIF is actually doing some work at the moment to ask, to come back to data providers and ask, are, are your records presence records or absence records? Because uh, what they're trying to do as well is also see an improvement in the records. Another one that we often have uh, find problems with is basis of record because it has quite a strict vocabulary. So if you could make sure that you check that your t the terms that are used in your database match the vocabulary of basis of record, uh, then you'll, you can fix those invalid flags. When talking about data quality, um, so there's something just to mention, which is uh, what Deb mentioned right at the start of the talks, which is that the discussion often assumes that what we're interested in is whether the data is fit for an ongoing research purpose, rather than what I've been talking about today, which has been, been about detecting errors that can be fixed. And Tadwig has had a working group looking at data quality over the last several years. Their emphasis has been very much on uh, assessing data quality with a fitness for use lens. This new paper um, and the DOI is included down there so on the slide if you uh, want to go and have a look at it, is certainly the most thorough look at data quality that anyone's achieved in the past few years. However, as I've described today, collection managers can use the data quality tests to our own ends to find errors or issues with the data so that we can keep refining and upgrading our data in many different ways um, and upgrading the data that comes through to the aggregators such as the Atlas or GBIF which does also eventually help the downstream users decide whether or not our improved data is in fact fit for their use. So that's all from me. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ellie. That was a wonderful talk. I'm gonna let Chris ask you some questions. I'm looking through here. We've got um, a question here. How do you establish an absence? Most species are rare and not finding them is not the same as a species being absent. Um, indeed, yes, you're quite right, uh, whoever asked that question. Um, so true, true absence is um, uh, how, how we would establish true absence um, these days would be we would take the data that, we've, that we know we have um, for occurrences in particular areas. Uh, we would um, plan a field trip with all of the things that we, we are hoping to go and see in that area. Um, we would then go at the right time of the year with the right uh, sampling protocols and the right, um, uh, the right methodology uh, and go in the right time of day, for example, uh, and go out and, and with all of those optimal conditions met, if we still can't find that thing, then we can say, uh, we could infer that it's a, a true absence. Now, of course, with some very rare things, um, you can do all of that and still not see the thing. 
um, so that there's been a, um, in Australia, there's been quite a discussion over a number of years now about night parrots and whether, whether or not they actually exist or not. Um, uh, they have recently been, been found again and started to, uh, there's been research done on them as well, but um, for many years they were thought to be extinct just because they were rare um, and no one had seen them. Um, so you're quite right that not seeing something doesn't necessarily mean absence, but there is a, there are some ways of going of structuring a field trip to uh, specifically look for absence, if that makes sense. Yes, there's a uh, there was some discussion as well about, and you might want to comment on the zero zero problem on your lat longs. How do those get in? There were some questions about how those get into the data set originally. Sometimes they just are helpfully added helpfully added by uh, your computer, your collection management system. Um, sometimes they're added helpfully by, if you've got someone actually do it, running your export, sometimes uh, exports out um, helpfully will add in, um, add in a zero, zero, because rather than add it, add, having a null record, um, co collection management systems are quite good at adding um, days and months into, into dates as well. So the another very common, um, uh, problematic piece of data is the first of the year. So collections that are that come through with the data is the first of January um, in whatever whatever year. Um, now, whilst it's quite possible that someone would go um, collecting on the first of January, it's more common that what was the only thing that was recorded, the only piece of data that was recorded in the collection management system is the year. And the either the export or the collection management system itself has helpfully added um, the extra data, um, which isn't actually very helpful. I don't see a question here, but I have a question. Has there been any effort to code data and data sets much like you would molecular sequencing data so you can get an overall quality score on the data set um, as, a, as a sum? So. Yeah, it's, um, there's certainly plenty of talk about doing that. Um, and it's, um, Oh, look, I, I always think it's a little bit like the discussions that we get into about um, about uh, rating rating um, people who are doing identifications. Um, you sort of get into this endless stream of who rates the rater. Um, and so I don't, people are very keen, certainly um, we've had at the Atlas, we've had quite a few requests from, um, particularly from government department users who want to use data um, for decision making purposes are very keen to get coded data that's got some sort of quality assurance measure on it. Um, but without, it, it, we haven't come up, we haven't yet come up with a good set of what would the, what are, what are all the assertions that that particular piece of data, would, that particular record would need to meet in order to get a higher or a lower quality rating. So it's certainly something we're trying to consider because we have got requests for it, but we don't, um, um, we don't entirely know yet. Um, I can see Deb's asking how that data that meet and the- I'm um, gonna actually transition us to our last talk, okay. but I would encourage the conversation to continue in the chat. There's a lot, a lot to talk about. Thank you so much, Ellie. <laughs> Pleasure. And so our final speaker in this symposium is Teresa Mayfield Meyer. And I am going to start sharing my screen for you, Teresa. So Teresa is going to be presenting on data management strategies for the extended specimen. And let me know if this doesn't look good. I'm gonna put it in presenter mode. Take it away, Teresa. Okay, thank you very much. Um, thanks everybody for being here and sticking around for the last talk. Um, I'm pretty sure everybody here is familiar with the concept of the extended specimen, so I'm not gonna go on about it, um, but I wanna point out that it calls out for digitization and links with associated extended data, and that it states that creating the network will require a monumental effort with a focus on digital and human infrastructure rather than physical infrastructure that makes magnitude of the effort required to build and sustain it harder to comprehend. Um, and so why is it harder to comprehend? I think it's because people are not considered permanent or infrastructure 
and that digital also seems less permanent than physical. Um, but you don't have to take that from me. Um, next slide, please. Oh, sorry, next slide. <laughs> um, this report called Unlocking Success in Digital Transformations was put out by McKinsey and Company. Um, and it discusses the success or not of digital transformations, which I think is what we're all attempting to do right now. Um, the results in the report demonstrate the difficulty of digital transformations and um, notes that less than 16% of them are successful or reported as successful. And that means they successfully improved performance and also equipped the organization to sustain changes in the long term. So I'd like for everybody to kind of digest that statistic of 16% because if you think about all of us doing these digitization efforts and if only 16% of us are successful, um, the extended specimen network is probably not going to be a thing. Um, so this report also points out that these failures have less to do with technology and more to do with managing the cultural and organizational challenges that a technological shift creates and that the involvement of key people leads to a greater probability of success. Um, and it's interesting that I feel like we've already touched on some of this in other talks. Um, next slide, please. Um, so I'm going to ask you what key employees are involved in your collections data management decisions. Um, and I think to make it a little more clear, um, we are not the key employees that I'm talking about. It's more your board, your CEO, um, the people in administration that we're still trying to get to understand what we're doing. Um, my personal experience now has been that these people tend to not even know what's going on with us, um, which pretty much increases the likelihood that what we're doing now is not going to be successful in the long term. Um, so if we were going to start from scratch, who would we involve in our um, decisions about digitizing and collections management? Next slide, please. And I would say that it should be everyone. Um, I'm pretty sure we've all heard something like people only care about what they know. Um, and I think we need to step out of our collection silo to involve other perspectives. And if we do that, we're going to end up with a more successful and sustainable digital project that will support the extended specimen, but also facilitate better exhibits, education programs, outreach, and research. Um, so how would you get this started. Um, next slide, please. Um, I think your mission statement is the best place to start. This little word cloud um, was generated from the mission statements of 100 natural history institutions, and it appears in the book Dinosaurs and Dioramas. If you haven't read it, you should. Um, the Extended Specimen Network promises to stimulate new avenues of investigation, expedite existing ones, provide an enhanced resource for making science-based policy decisions and to serve as an effective tool to educate and inform broad and diverse audiences about biodiversity and data science with significant potential to engage, educate, and empower the next generation of biodiversity data stewards, researchers, and data users. So I think if you take what the extended specimen network is promising and match it with your mission statement, it seems like it wouldn't be a very hard sell to your board or leadership that what you're doing um, is important to the museum. So I would say you should start with your museum's mission statement. Next slide, please. Um, you should know it, and it's probably one of the most important tools you have to get the support you need to participate in the extended specimen network and also to improve the quality of your data. Um, in addition to your mission statement, I think knowing the American Association Museum uh, of Museums core standards is a good thing. Um, and in particular, they call for a commitment or to demonstrate a commitment to providing the public with physical and intellectual access to the museum and its resources, which is exactly what the Extended Specimen Network is attempting to do with regard to intellectual access. Um, so I think um, using these two resources to explain to your admins that 
this is what we are doing it and we need more support to do it well will probably boost the success of your project. Next slide, please. So um, the other thing is, is, and we kind of touched on this a little previously, but is your museum's data publicly accessible um, and is it linked to um, outside resources? So um, putting your data on GBIF does make it publicly accessible, but I'm not sure it makes it publicly accessible to your museum's community as it's related in your mission statement. So um, thinking about how your collection management system presents your data and to whom it presents it is probably something important as well. Um, because we have to remember that we're striving for intellectual accessibility. So somebody should be able to use that data to do something. Um, uh, next slide, please. So let's talk about the links with associated extended data. Um, we definitely should be thinking about links to GenBank accessions or related specimens in other collections. Um, but some of that is out of our control because the related resource doesn't offer the ability to link or there isn't enough information to make a definitive link. Um, so let's look at some stuff we can control and public resources that can be useful, which we've already touched on. Um, Wikipedia allows for long definitions of terms that you're probably using in your collection management system. So if you see the link at the top of this slide, um, every reference to that link makes it pretty clear where you mean as opposed to the million different ways you or anyone entering data might spell Doña Ana County, New Mexico. Um, so using these open resources lets others know exactly what you mean. And um, while it's great for geography, it can be used for other things. Next slide, please. So unambig unambiguously presenting people in collections data is just as important. And um, the great thing about Wikipedia and Wikidata is that you can add the people, edit the profiles, but even better, the community can add people for you or uh, make those profiles better. Uh, Wikidata identifiers are being used by Bionomia to create new ways of visualizing individual researcher contributions to museum collections. And your link to these resources means that communities searching your collection data can branch out and learn more about the people who collected, prepared, and identified specimens. Um, and not only the specimens that you manage, but specimens at other institutions that are connected to those resources. Um, so let's also talk about identifications. Next slide, please. Connecting your identifications to taxa and public resources helps to avoid the many possible misspellings or alternate taxon names that you might mean. Managed taxon authorities like the World Register of Marine Species and the Paleobiology Database can be especially useful, but they're not always comprehensive and they are often not possible for you to edit. The advantage of Wikipedia and Wikidata is the ability to add and edit resources and the fact that others can help you to create the information you need. And for those of you who have sworn you'll never use something that can be edited by anyone, I suggest you dig into these resources. Next slide, please. Although I enjoy creating and editing Wikipedia articles, in my database work, I'm starting to find Wikidata to be the more useful resource and one that truly speaks to the idea of linked data. Wikidata is a free, collaborative, multilingual secondary database stru collecting structured data to provide support for Wikipedia, Wikimedia Commons, and the other wikis of the Wikimedia movement, and to anyone in the world. While I've had difficulty getting articles published in Wikipedia because of notability issues, Wikidata is, far, is much more forgiving. To create a new Wikidata item, all you need is at least one valid site link to a Wikimedia entity page or evidence that the item refers to an instance of a clearly identifiable conceptual or material entity that can be described using serious and publicly available references. This criterion is flexible as a new item can also be created to fulfill a structural need. For example, it is needed to make statements made in other items more useful. I love the Wikidata use common sense policy, which states, if another policy or guideline prevents a useful contribution to Wikidata, use common sense and ignore it. 
but there's a wiki project that I feel could be very useful to our community and we seem to be willfully ignoring it. Next slide, please. I really don't understand why our community hasn't embraced the Wiki Species Project. Um, it seems like it's a resource we could all share and contribute to, one that allows for translation to other languages, connection to appropriate literature, an identifier for each taxonomic term with built-in tools, connecting synonyms, and adding new terms as they are defined. It kind of seems like a no-brainer to me. Next slide, please. Wiki species is an open wiki-based species directory and central database of taxonomy. It is aimed at the needs of scientific users rather than general users. The project page notes that the need for a project such as wiki species is evidenced by the lack of a formal center for taxonomic classification, a major problem for biology. Having had no proper centrality for classification, problems have arisen in the multiple classification of the same species, twice, three times, or even more. The success of Wikipedia in maintaining and harboring of vast amounts of knowledge has demonstrated that an online aggregator is truly the best tool for the kind of species directory that the biological community so needs. And for those of you um, who think that uh, this is just gonna be problematic because we don't know who's editing this stuff, next slide, please. Two minute warning. I'd like to introduce you to, to Siobhan, who is with us today, by the way, um, and check out her ORCID ID profile, which we've been discussing because hers is an excellent example of how it should be used. Um, if you're wondering who contributes to Wikipedia and Wikidata, she's one of those people. And uh, in my personal experiences, the many voices of a community generally lead to a better outcome. So you should let others help you, and there are people who want to help. But the one thing I don't want us to forget is that for many, volunteering is not an option and paid work builds resumes and feeds families. Also, while the resources of the wicked community are free, we all know there's no such thing. If you're going to rely on this community resource, consider setting aside something every month to support it. Just like public radio or television, the Wikimedia Foundation is a nonprofit that relies on donors to pay for the hardware and people required to keep it running. Do not take them for granted. And this brings me back to the Extended Specimen Network's discussion of human infrastructure. Managing a, a collection management system with the goal of participation in the Extended Specimen Network requires people. Next slide, please. So you or someone you work with or an interested community member could be one of the passionate people participating in Wiki's community of knowledge linking. Why not pay an intern to learn to edit Wikipedia, Wikidata, or Wiki Species and help make these resources work for you, the museum collections, and the community they are meant to serve. The more eyes on your data, the better it is likely to be. Are you willing to let go of it and allow others to participate in its creation? Next slide, please. In the book, Active Collections, there's a slim chapter titled Question the Database, which asks us to check our authority over all of the information in the collections database and to consider who beyond the walls of the museum might use the information it contains and how we might make it more inclusive. Could we allow outsiders to participate in creating our part of the extended specimen network? As the author points out, making database systems more inclusive maximizes our investment of populating and sustaining them by making the information more useful both internally and externally. She also notes that there is incredible potential for stakeholders outside of the museum to contribute to museum information capacity building through tagging schemes, authority to enter specific fields, or by adding emotional comments and multimedia responses. She challenges us to create databases that are culturally responsive. This seems especially important at this moment in time. Next slide, please. I can feel the eye rolls, but hear me out. Uh, the recent IMLS CARES funding opportunity called for high impact projects that will use appropriate existing data sets to address the needs of the community and our target audiences and to provide shareable results. While the extended specimen network requires that collection database interfaces be redesigned to both attract and facilitate use by a broader user base, if we are to take full advantage of the rich data content and broad relevance of the network. 
what better way to meet these kinds of needs than with the help of the community we are supposed to be serving? As long as collection data remains mostly hidden from the public or only available through source, sources such as GBIP and IDIGBIO, we are not properly serving our local community. The people who sustain our institutions with their taxes, tuition, memberships, and entrance fees also deserve a voice in the information we present about our collections. And as they get to know the collections, it is more likely they will appreciate their worth and the funding required to maintain them. Next slide, please. So can we forge a new path? Interestingly, I found support for the Extended Specimen Network in a book about trails. Near the end of this book, the author takes a look at the internet and its resemblance to the physical trails we create to take us places and the ways in which they branch and fork and sometimes turn back on themselves. He acknowledges that on each successive level of path making, knowledge is accrued and the world becomes easier to navigate, but new paths must be constantly marked out in order to simplify the vast wilderness of older paths into something humans can manage. Are we willing to create some new paths? to map and manage them over time, if it will make our collections meaningful to the community, I think the answer must be yes, because we are funded by the community, and if we aren't seen as relevant, funding will be cut. I also believe that we have to step out of our silo, both within our institutions and without. Maybe if we shared readings like those in this presentation with our associates in education, exhibits, development, and even with our board, we could begin a dialogue that would increase the likelihood that our digital transformation to the extended specimen network will succeed and be sustained. Next slide. So I'd like to thank everyone who developed the concept of the ESN because they are adding fuel to my fire. Um, all of my co-conspirators at Arctos because they get it and they're a wonderful community to be part of. The New Mexico Museum of Natural History and Science for taking the leap to start their node of the ESN. And thank you all for listening. And I hope that I will have interesting conversations with all of you in the future. Next slide. Thank you so much, Teresa. And I'll point out that there's a lot of links in these presentations. Most of the talks are linked to the agenda on the Google Doc that we've been sharing. So if you want to go look up the links, you can find them there. We just have one minute for questions. Chris, do we have any for Teresa? Yeah, there's one at the bottom there that hasn't been addressed, um, and you may or may not know the answer. Does Specify Software System support connectivity to Wicked Species and Wicked Data? <laughs> so I don't know the answer to that question. Um, maybe there's somebody in here who does. Um, I primarily work with Arctos, and we definitely have that ability, but we haven't made really good use of it yet. So it's something that I'm going to be pressing on. Great. Um, and then there was a question about how well Wikipedia is, is funded, but David Shorthouse indicates that it seems to be pretty well funded. What, do you know anything more about the funding structure for that and how well supported they are long term? No, I don't actually, but it's, you can probably find out, I would imagine, since they're a nonprofit. Um, but I know that I give money every month just personally because I feel like it's one of the resources I use on an almost daily basis because everything you Google, that's the first thing you get. Um, and I feel like a resource that's that important should be supported. So it really should be, I think if we're going to start using it um, as a tool in our collection management systems, we should encourage our institutions to contribute um, to that resource because it's, it's a tool that we should be paying for. It's a really good point. So I wanna thank you again, Teresa, and thank you to all of our speakers today. Um, also thank you to Chris, he's been co-moderating with me. And then uh, most of our organizing team for this symposium was also presenting in this symposium, but one who did not is Shelley James, who's been really instrumental in, in getting this together. And then I'd also like to thank Spinach, who the virtual organizing committee pulled off an amazing meeting two weeks ago, including our desire to postpone this symposium to today. So big thank you to them. Uh, the recording for this symposium will be posted to the Spinach YouTube channel probably by the end of the week. Um, and then finally, thank you to all of you for coming and we really appreciate the participation at all hours of the day and night. So I hope that people have a good rest of the day or a good night of sleep. 
I think a lot of conversations came up today that people are interested in talking more about. So I'd encourage all of you to connect with each other via that Google Doc. In particular, there was a lot of talk about uh, how we can use social media in a way that doesn't take over our work lives. Uh, and I think Megan started a place in the Google Doc for people that would like to connect specifically on that topic. So on that note, thank you so much and uh, we'll see you another time.